All right, Greg Cooper uh, has spent 30 years in education. First, he was a middle school science teacher, then moved on to central office, where he was a director. And then uh, he spent time um, uh, as a high school biology teacher, or, excuse me, central office director. And uh, while there, he spent time uh, working at the state level, um, editing the My Big Project, and as a trainer for the My Climb Project. Since then, uh, he uh, had contracted cancer, and, um, and as a result, he began to question himself, uh, telling himself that I need to get back to what it is that I actually love. And so he actually went back into the classroom. And so he's going to talk to us tonight about uh, implementing the NGSS and the challenges that he's overcome in his classroom. Please welcome uh, Greg Cooper. Good afternoon. It's good to see you all here today. I'll be talking about implementing NGSS in the classroom. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to talk to you about the, my training. Uh, last spring, I had the opportunity to train under Dr. Greg Johnson, who works right here at RISA. Uh, me and a colleague of mine, Dr. or not Dr. Uh, Kathy German, from my high school at uh, John Glenn High School, um, came here for the training. We came to five days of training uh, out of the seven days that were available to us, and we had some awesome training under these standards, and we began to realize that there was an awful lot that we didn't know. We both had uh, lots of veteran experience in the classroom, but there was an awful lot of, uh, to this NGSS that uh, just really intimidated us, and the more we went at it, the more we realized that there was a lot in front of us that we had to experience. We also went to the NS uh, NSTA conference uh, here in Detroit, and that really whetted our appetite. We were able to apply a lot of things, we were able to break out into different sessions. She was a chemistry teacher, I'm a biology teacher, we really learned a lot there. Uh, so this year, we uh, started out school year, I, I absolutely wanted to start the very first day. A lot of people like to go over rules, pass out books, do a lot of that type of thing. And, and right off the get-go, um, on that very first day, I started out with uh, phenomenal investigation and um, had the students draw their very first student models. And uh, it, was, it was pretty, pretty messy to begin with, as you can imagine. Uh, we didn't have anything to build from. And uh, I started right out with my very first um, phenomenal investigation of, is it alive? And basically, he started out with this substance that was uh, a form of glue, put it in a petri dish with water, and it kind of mimicked uh, three to six of the traits of matter, depending on how loose you wanted to be with it under next generation science standards, there's seven traits of life recognized. And um, pretty much told a cockamamie bull story and tried to really convince the kids, don't ever believe anything adults say, especially me, and to try to get them to think. <clears throat> and on that first day of school, I had them break off into groups of three, had those giant post-it notes, and if anyone bought stocks in that, um, I'm sure they're millionaires uh, today, because that's what we all do under NGSS, right, was you do these giant student models. And then it had the students then go ahead and um, make those student models. Um, speaking of student models, there's my grandson, Reed. I don't know how he got up there, but <laughs> what a cutie he is. I don't know how that happened. But back, back to student models, um, th that's an example of one of the student models that we're talking about. And, uh, you know, that it had the students pretty much, uh, you know, put some color on it, try to add some life, do a before and after, and, um, you know, really had them try to describe what was happening. And, have, you know, we talked about what the seven traits of student models were, or, or seven traits of being alive were, and then what I had them try to do to try to understand what a student model was is had them put sticky notes and try to put some positive and possibly negative comments about what they saw about it. I had them put the names of... Um, whoever what was it made the models on the back. I didn't want it to become a popularity contest of I like it because so-and-so did it or I didn't like it because so-and-so did it. And that seemed to be a real positive thing. So that was the very first student model that we did. Here's another student model that we did oh, about five or six weeks later. Um, this one was based on a burning log model. And this phenomenon investigation was based on the idea that I brought a log in from our camper and uh, brought some ashes that you know, pretty much assimilated what the log would have burned down to and pretty much said to the kid, what happened to the, to the mass of this log? And had them draw out the student model of, of what happened and, and what happened to this mass. Here's another example of the same kind of um, phenomenon investigation. And they could do it in a variety of ways. They could put words to go along with it and whatnot. And uh, again, they got better and better at it as we did it. It's just like any kind of a system. Once the kids understand what the process is, they get better at it. They get more comfortable with it. And they actually get excited about it. It was really, really very interesting. So that brings us to the next step. I, I, I happen to use whiteboards, and this builds upon the logic of, of what the student models were. 
And it also sets the basis and foundation for argumentative conversation. You need to have something in which the kids can argue. And you can't just have opinion, you need to have facts. We know in science it's all based on facts, right? So here's an example. Try to be very, very consistent with what that looked like. And so and in the whiteboards that we use, it's, we talk about the guiding question, we talk about the claim, they've got to make a stance, uh, the evidence and the justification for evidence. And this is an example of them actually incorporating what the, going back to the, um, the, the burning log, what was the mass of the, of the ash, what was the mass of the log, and they went on to try to explain what they thought happened to the mass of, of, of that log. Uh, here's another example of a student whiteboard where we did something entirely different. Uh, this one happened to talk about the Eurasian collared dove. I don't know if you're familiar with that invasive species, but in this particular one, in a nutshell, basically had the students go to the computer lab and they compared to this invasive species, and each group of three was assigned the idea of what happened to, they got to choose two local birds from a specific state, and they wanted to see what happened to the population of those two species as the invasive um, Eurasian collared dove went there, and they had to do research on this, and then they compared it compared to other students' research. And in this example, they had the guiding question to claim our evidence and their justification. And, you, and like anything in science, we want to be able to compare data. We want to be able to see what it was like. And that was the part of their justification for evidence. As you can see here, the Eurasian collared dove is a dark blue. You see here where their population increased, and the other two local bird populations decreased here. And here you had another example of a, white, of a student whiteboard, and I just kind of picked this out of random of different classes. This one has to do with uh, Darwin's theory of descent with modification. And in this example, um, and this was with my accelerated biology classes, um, they basically went to a website and they were assigned four specific mammals, and there were six ones that they could choose from, and they basically had to measure the length and width of specific mammalian brains and they had to see if they could come up with this idea of support or non-support for um, this descent with modification. And they had to decide, are they going to use surface area, are they going to use a length to width type of um, comparison? But they didn't know anything about what those things meant. So they had to kind of figure it out when they talked about this argument of conversation, which is really, really fascinating. And again, back to using data. They used data, they used graphs. They could choose what kind of graphs they wanted to use. They could use charts, however they wanted to report the data. Really, really interesting. And then there's Reed. I don't know where the heck he comes from, but for an eight-week-old, that kid just gets around. So back to argument of conversation. There's different ways you can do it. There's small group conversation. There's individual conversation and argument of conversation. And there's whole group wrap-up you can do as a teacher. Now, being a science teacher or being involved in science education, as, as, as probably all of you are involved in some way, shape, or form, it doesn't really matter how you do it, but at the end of the day, if you do five classes of it, you're just plain out shot. Back in the traditional science uh, methodology, I used to be called, I used to call it Mr. Cooper to death. Uh, in this situation, if you do small group and you're working with 10 groups of three, it's a little bit more streamlined in how you do it, because um, it's, it's a different way of managing it, but, it, but, it, but it's really, really interesting. Um, you know, what's different about next generation science standards is that we're approaching this from a, the aspect of we, um, as opposed to the old way where we would kind of use labs more of a culminating experience of do the kids understand it fully under next generation science standards, we know this is more about this is how we introduce information. So there are misconceptions that are, that are galore. And now the challenge is for us as teachers is at what point do we nip these in the butt or not. So here are examples of kids doing argumentative conversation. I can just take a moment. So we have Shira and Jocelyn defend their data while Jay, Arbery, and Alec challenge them with questions. Owen and Alexis look pretty proud of themselves while Samantha looks a little stumped. Now that's argumentation. Sometimes the camera takes students off the argumentative task, just gas Susan and Samantha. Sean's reviewing Anthony's data. P.S. It was Halloween today. So. Some things are a little more difficult than I thought as we transition over to NGSS. Uh, so, like I mentioned a little bit, little bit ago, sometimes uh, letting student misconceptions go on and how long in which to let it go. That's a challenge as a classroom teacher. Trusting small group conversations to continue while I'm working with other groups. That's a realistic challenge. Allowing students to discover and uncover information and not have the teacher be the sole provider of information. That's a challenge. It's not a bad challenge, it's just a challenge. And makeup work for absent students can be more nebulous for teachers to create and grade. I mean, that's, that's realistic. When a kid's not there, you can't just redo that lab. 
Now, you can do it, but you just have got to come up with a way to deal with that. Some things are easier than I thought. Students are definitely more connected to what we're doing and, it's with, with, and with how we're doing it. That, that makes it more, you know, that just makes them with it, if you will. Uh, once they understand the process, it makes it much easier for all involved, especially for future projects for our class and others, like I mentioned going into it. Once they understand how we do business, they're on board with it. They, you don't have to reteach it every single time. And if I'm doing it and other teachers start doing it, they really get how to do it. And the discipline, discipline issues are greatly reduced as students tend to be engaged and empowered as groups. I mean, those things are all things that I didn't think about, but it all it seems to make sense. It seems to make it easier. Now, we also had a STEM trip to the University of Michigan, and my hat's off to U of M, which is one of our local colleges. They offered us the opportunity, and just my mind was, you know, turned on to this idea. We brought 50, uh, 40, I think it was 54 students to U of M. Um, about half of them were from my class, and half of them were other 9th and 10th graders from John Glenn, and it was just a really, really cool experience, and uh, we loved it. Savannah, Carter, Nishan, and Duane create this self-prepared vehicle. Maddie, Gina, and Sarah engineer some mathematical equations. Jaden, Donovan, and Bryce looking cool building a two-liter pop bottle rocket. Madison, Holly, and Sky building a rocket of their own. I thought I heard them say, girls rule and boys drool. <laughs> and lastly, Charles was recruited to take part in a demonstration on waves in their property. He wasn't too embarrassed to do that either. Okay, so lastly, once we started the school year, um, we were, uh, Ms. German and I were kind of asked to share this with our colleagues, and we were very happy to do so. Uh, getting everyone on board um, wasn't really necessarily easy, but they were curious about some of the things that we wanted to do because we were starting the school year, we hadn't done it yet. So we did share it with our colleagues, and it was pretty cool. And um, they've been great. And as the school year has gone on, we've shared examples of what student work looked like. Um, we also have another high school. We're John Glenn High School. We've got William Memorial High School. We also have a Tinkham Alternative High School. We've had their science representative join us as well, too, so we've shared in that manner. Also, we've got a district secondary science curriculum committee, and we share it from that aspect. We've got um, our curriculum director, Mr. Aaron Boffman, who's been interested. And now the discussions we're having is, now we need to have teachers see this in action. Are we going to push into other classrooms? Are we going to have people from other districts get into our classrooms? We're talking about, from a collegiality point of view, it's not just talking about how do we actually see this in action. And that's kind of where we're at now. That's beyond really trying to rip up our curriculum and really trying to align to the NGSS standards. My personal accountability this year is I had to hit where the rubber meets the road. And for my teacher evaluation, I, you might, I hit my two goals as student modeling and argument of conversation. And I will say that my principal did a great job getting in the classroom. She was really supportive. And she, I made sure, and she made sure that we, we aligned our schedules and she came in the classroom when I really focused on these things. It was really, really cool. Lastly, God, this kid gets around. He gets up to, he's 12 weeks old this week. Here's Reed again. And I just want to say to you, thanks for coming out. Hopefully you got something out of this. And my contact information is up there. If you have any questions or anything, I can help you with CooperG at www.csd.net. And thanks a lot. Hope you have some great sessions today.